Welcome back to episode eight. We are in season three of Outgrowing the Good Christian Girl, and this season is called A Deconstructed Life, all about how do we live, how do we honor God and honor scripture, and build a faith community as we've been deconstructing our faith and asking hard questions and rethinking some of our theology. And today I have our second sod story of this season. Again, not to be confused with a sob story. A sod story is a story of deconstruction, and we have three of these this season, and this is the second one. And I'm so excited for you you to talk with a friend of mine today. My friend's name is Heather, and she's talking about her experience of coming out as a pastor's kid. If you've wondered if somebody can be in the LGBTQ community and have a vibrant faith, this is the episode for you. Or if you've ever wondered, how do I build bridges with people who think differently, who have different theological beliefs on this topic, but at the core, we share this wanting to love and honor God and others in scripture. How do we build bridges? That's a huge thing we're talking about in today's episode, because that's something that Heather personally feels called to do. Heather grew up as the youngest of seven kids. Her dad was a pastor. She was homeschooled most of the way through until the end of high school, and now she's an art major in college. And she is going to share her story with you today. Here's one of my favorite quotes from today's episode. There were, I think, three churches in New Paltz, and I knew I wanted to go back to church. I hadn't really been to church in about a year. And so there was, you know, two churches that were relatively accepting. They had their pride flags outside. And then I decided I wanted to go to the one that wasn't openly accepting necessarily because that was what I found theologically rich. And I really liked the pastor. I really loved the worship. A lot of my friends thought that was weird when <laughs> there are other options. And I'm kind of like, well, it's not really weird to me because mm. our, like the core of our faith is the same. And that's what matters. Like they show the love of Jesus to the community. Perfect. I want to do that too. Mm. So that's I just, love that. I just want to be a mediator because we all aren't that different, but we have such strict walls that separate us. Oh my goodness. Today's conversation is so good. I can't wait for you to hear it. First, as always, a word from our sponsors, BetterHelp. Deconstructing your faith is stressful. When you're rethinking what you've taken for granted, asking questions about how we understand scripture or about sexuality or different theological things, it can feel really overwhelming. The thing that helps me the most on my deconstruction journey was therapy. It gave me space to process my thoughts instead of avoid the discomfort. And it gave me a wise sounding board where I could safely share all my questions and not be afraid of going off the deep end. That's where our sponsors better help come in. They will match you with a licensed, experienced therapist, usually within just 48 hours of signing up. If you'd like a Christian therapist, you can just choose that option on the sign-up form and then let your therapist know how involved you'd like faith to be in your sessions, if at all. You can meet with your therapist from anywhere in the world because your sessions are all online. And if you don't connect with your first therapist, you can always switch to another. This takes away the headache and stress of trying to line up a therapist on your own. So if you two are deconstructing your faith, check out betterhelp.com slash Tiffany Dawn for 10% off your first month of therapy. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash Tiffany Dawn. And now let's get into Heather's episode. Heather, thank you so much for being here and coming on my podcast. I'm so happy to have you. So happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. I loved sitting down for you with coffee a few months ago. And I am thinking ever since then, I need my viewers. I need my viewers to hear Heather's story. Like I think you have just, oh, I won't get ahead of myself, but this beautiful, (laughs) unique journey and I just, I think people need to hear it. So before we dive into your story, let me ask you a couple of questions that I'm asking all my interviewees this season Mm -hmm. about deconstruction, since this is our season about a deconstructed life. So first of all, what does deconstruction mean to you? I know it's a term that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. So for you personally, what does that mean? Yeah, I feel like growing up, I always heard deconstruction in a very negative light. Um, It was always associated with people that like had an agenda for their Bible reading. Um, And I feel like for me, as I've gone on this journey of deconstruction, um, it just really means understanding the intent of the Bible in today's world. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding that we don't know all of the answers and holding on to what we do know, what the core of our faith is, Mm -hmm. um, and just breaking down why we believe what we believe rather than just, um, you know, listening to pastors or famous people you know, authors or things like that. And really looking at the Bible for ourselves and understanding what our faith really means. So Mm. that's how I view deconstruction. Yeah. And I think you're right. There's 
that's the thing I've heard all the time too. There's an agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think (laughs) the people I know personally, including yourself and many other Mm -hmm. people who are deconstructing, we don't want to deconstruct. (laughs) This is very uncomfortable. (laughs) Yes, definitely. There is not an agenda here. It is Mm -hmm. like God calling us into deconstruction, Mm -hmm. it feels like. So yeah, I think I like how you describe that for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, deconstruction also has had a lot to do with how I understand the Bible and its intent and wanting to learn how do I honor the Bible, but that also meant I needed to rethink how I understood it. So Mm -hmm. the second question I'm asking every guest this season Mm -hmm. is, how has your approach to the Bible shifted over the years growing up as a pastor's kid and Mm -hmm. a Christian your whole life? And how do you currently understand its intent? Mm -hmm. I really love this question. Um, I think growing up, surrounded constantly by the narrative of like really rich theology um Mm. even as like an elementary schooler i could i could see myself like talking about old testament passages and Mm. all of these rich theology things that maybe weren't developmentally appropriate and i kind of (laughs) missed the the message of the gospel in a lot of Mm. ways um and Mm. just how rich that is so i think i really used to get stuck in trying to do everything right, trying to mm. be the perfect Christian girl. Um, mm. And rather than just seeing the Bible as what it is, and I, I was just talking with my mom about this yesterday. I think if God wanted a written book of rules, that's mm. what he would have given us. He would have given mm. us an extension of the Ten Commandments, but he yeah. gave us such a complex book full of stories of broken people in messy lives and how he works through that. And I think that that is so beautiful. Mm. So now I really feel like as I've really deconstructed my faith and I look at the Bible, I try to understand what I know to be 100% certain, like the gospel. And that's what I went Mm. back to. Um, Just really diving into the gospel, what I felt like I probably should have started with as an elementary (laughs) schooler. I was reading like all of like Genesis and Numbers and, uh, you know, and and I'm like, let me dive into Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of the, all the gospels Mm. and then build my way out. Um, That's Mm. really what I've been doing the past two years. And now I feel like my understanding of the intent of the Bible is that it's okay to not really know everything, that it's a complex book. Um, And I think God wants us to look at it that way. I don't think God really wants us to be so fed up on searching for the answers, but rather understanding it holistically and understanding his unconditional love for his people. Um, So that's really how I've been looking at the Bible more recently. I love that. And I love how it's like, Mm -hmm it becomes such a journey. It's not Mm -hmm. like a destination of knowing it all. It's like this journey, Mm -hmm. mysterious in many ways. So yeah, no, I love how you explained that. Okay, Mm -hmm. let's dive into your story. I'm so excited for my viewers (laughs) to hear your story. Um, Would you share with us what your life and faith were like growing up? Yes. So, I mean, you said I'm a pastor's kid. Um, I'm the youngest of seven. I was homeschooled growing up, so had a lot going for me. Um, Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, growing up, I I really enjoyed church. I, I had all my friends there. I never had um really any negative associations with church. I <sighs> like, you know, I was in Awana. I was in church groups. I would go to camp. Um, and I just felt like I had it all together. Mm. <laughs> um, I think in middle school and high school, well, when I was 12, sorry, let me back up. Yeah, no, I was, take your time. <laughs> When I was 12, my older sibling came out and that was like a big culture shock, I guess, to me because Mm -hmm. I hadn't really heard much about um, what that really meant. And I was really close with my siblings. So seeing how my family reacted and when it kind of got into our church, how they reacted, Mm -hmm. that really was unsettling to me because Mm -hmm. I... First, I didn't really realize why it was their business in the first place to be worrying (laughs) about my older sibling. But also, I just felt like the message of the Bible that I was getting was we're supposed to be loving people and we're supposed to be these lights of Jesus. And by condemning someone, even if you think they're sinning, why would you condemn them? Like, to me, that just pushes Mm. them away. So I never really understood why there were these adverse reactions. Um, Mm. And so then that kind of started my season of questioning that lasted really through all of high school. Mm -hmm. And 
as I started asking these questions, um, my mom was also going through a season of just struggling in Mm -hmm. how the church was reacting to issues in the world. So we really went through this together, which I think Mm -hmm. is really beautiful that we had that vulnerability together to ask questions. And for her to be so open that it is important to ask questions Mm -hmm. um, and that asking questions doesn't mean you're invalidating the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that was really important for me to understand. So most of our, like most of my faith, I feel like was worked through with her. and, That's amazing. Yeah. And so I think in, in high school, I felt like I was kind of stuck in this loop of um, bitterness towards the church and how I, I felt like I was reading a totally different Bible than hmm. the members of my childhood church. And that was just really hard for me, you know? Hmm. So... Yeah, I think that that's like a that's a good background, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If there's anything you want me to expand on, you can obviously ask. No, I think that's... Yeah, I... Yeah, I'm going to come back to some of this in a couple of questions, I think. Yeah, no, that's a really good background. So when did you start wondering if you might be gay? And what Mm. was that process like for you? Did your did your faith affect the process or the process affect your faith? And if so, how? Yes, my faith definitely affected that process. Um, I know a lot of people in the queer community um, kind of know from a very young age that, you know, they they were queer. And that mm-hmm. was not the case for me at all. It mm-hmm. wasn't really on my radar. Um, and by the time I was in high school, I was really questioning a lot of these things. And then the thought would always kind of come up and I would just kind of shove it down. Like, mm-hmm. I, I would wonder you know, all my friends really, really liked boys. And I was like, I feel like I should be feeling these things too. Never really happened. I would just kind of Mm. pick someone to have a crush on, which Uh I think is a common narrative (laughs) for a lot of people. Um, And yeah. And so I think it was your video really stood out to me when you uploaded Mm. a video about, I don't remember the exact title. I think it was, Can a Christian Be Gay? Mm. And I remember looking at that and being like, what does Tiffany think about this? So I like click on it. And and it was the first time I had heard a Christian even allude to the fact that you could be gay and be a Christian and that Mm. that's okay. And I had never, Mm. ever heard that before. So Mm. suddenly when I, you know, when that thought would come up, I'd be like, no, no. I mean, maybe for some people, but not for me. Mm. Um, And in high school, I transferred from homeschooling to a public school Mm. because I was just really not having a good time in my circle of Christian friends. I felt like there was some bullying going on. There was Mm. um, just a lot of fakeness. And I really despise when people are fake. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) it doesn't come naturally to me. I think I'm a genuine person. And so Mm. I really struggle when people are saying things that they don't mean. Mm. And so when I transferred to school, I um, I started meeting new friends, but I really didn't make a solid friend group until senior year. So I was there mm-hmm. for junior and senior year. Halfway through senior year, I was in the theater department um, and I had had a boyfriend and I really wasn't in a good place with my faith. I was just mm-hmm. kind of stuck, like I said, in that cycle of bitterness towards the church, but also kind of clinging to, I know Jesus is good, but the church is just not what I want to be a part of. Mm. And so I was in a relationship with this boy. He wasn't a Christian, um, but he had queer parents. And so Mm. I think part of me saw, oh, he has to be a good person because he has a pride sticker on his laptop or something like that. (laughs) And I just thought that was so cool that like a boy in high school could do that. Mm. And part of me realizes I think I really wanted to date him because of his parents um, Mm. being queer. And so I think that drew me and it was not a good relationship. So I ended it. But I just remember thinking like I had zero feelings for this boy. Hmm. And I tried to have another boyfriend, zero feelings there. So then I, I really went through like a breakdown halfway Hmm. through my senior year because I realized like I, I can't tolerate men. I can't (laughs) tolerate them in relationships. I can't. Hmm. And so, um, and so that was really hard for me because I was trying to be this good Christian girl. And I felt like what I was supposed to be was just the polar opposite of who I was. Hmm. And so I felt like 
I just had two identities that were constantly conflicting. Hmm. And I just was never being genuine, which was, again, inner turmoil because I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it was it was really hard. Um, But that was pretty much how I found out I was gay was really through trying to be in a relationship with a man, realizing mm. that wasn't going to work out. Um, mm. And then I decided to, like, pursue a relationship with one of my friends who was a girl. And at that point, I wasn't out at all. Mm. Um, but you know, we were talking and all those things and that didn't really work out because I was going to college. And so I was crushed. I was like sobbing for days. Mm. And I realized like, I think I really loved this person and mm. I hadn't felt that for anyone else before. So that was kind of my confirmation of this isn't just those little intrusive thoughts. Like this is real. This is who mm. I am and what am I going to do with it? Mm. Um, so that was definitely like my experience. Yeah. So how was that with your faith. Could you tell us a little bit about that mm -hmm. kind of wrestling if you feel comfortable? Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. of course. So with my faith, I just felt like deep down, I was born a sin, essentially, is what I felt like. Mm -hmm. And I started writing a lot of poetry about it. Um, and I would just write poetry about how I felt like it wasn't fair that I was was born like this and how could I be born like this if God doesn't want me to be like this if that makes sense mm -hmm. um yeah. so hang on I need to think how to phrase this better <laughs> I think you're um, doing a really good job like okay thank I'm totally you. tracking with you yeah yeah thank you thank I felt like in a lot of Christian circles it's very normal to ask questions my mom mm -hmm. encourages asking questions mm -hmm. but I didn't understand why certain topics we don't question like homosexuality right. is one of those topics yeah and I think a lot of Christians target that sin because they don't struggle with it. Mm. Um, and I think it's very easy if you don't struggle with something to point it out and to say, oh, look at them. But if you struggle mm. with gossip, like we aren't going to talk about gossip, like because that, you know, <laughs> but that affects people. And so it's just there's yes. a double standard that I didn't understand. So mm. I was scared to ask questions and I was scared to that people were going to question my faith just because of these questions I was asking. Right, um, right. So that was definitely a challenge in my faith. And I really decided that once I, once I came out and once I knew that I was gay, mm. I felt like it was put on my heart to be in the middle of both of those groups because mm. I knew I wanted to be openly gay. But I also knew that I loved Jesus and I didn't think that this was wrong. Like deep down, mm -hmm. I just didn't think that it was wrong. And and I would try to tell myself, well, maybe it is and maybe I'll be convicted. And that just wouldn't happen. Like I would be hmm. praying like, God, please convict me of this. Like everyone's mm -hmm. telling me that this is, you know, Satan driving me in the other direction. So like convict me if it is nothing happens. Hmm. And I end up meeting my partner who I've been with for a year and a half. And we have had the best relationship hmm. I could have asked for. And the love that we share, the, we just, we just mesh perfectly hmm. and they aren't a Christian, but, and so that was another thing I was talking with my mentors and, hmm. you know, they're kind of like, oh, we'll just pray that they, you know, like are more open to your faith. And they go to church with me, like they'll go to church with me on some Sundays or mm -hmm. will always be talking about my faith. So currently I felt like coming out as gay m meshed those identities. Mm -hmm. And in some ways I would feel, you know, people trying to pull them apart or, you know, both sides kind of hating me, but mm -hmm. I just felt like it was put on my heart to be in the middle and mm -hmm. to just be okay with that. You know, there's nothing I can really do to change it. So I might as well try to just exist there. <laughs> that is the part of your story that I think is so unique and mm -hmm. just so inspiring. And we're going to get into this more in a minute, but this idea of building bridges, you mm -hmm. said that over and over in our coffee date, like mm -hmm. wanting, being in the middle and wanting to build bridges. And I think that is brave and inspiring. And I wish there was more of that in the church because that's what we need. Mm -hmm. We don't need sides. We need bridges. And mm -hmm. so we're going to talk about that more in a minute too. But first, would you tell us um, when you came out to your Christian community, how did people respond, whether good or bad? And did mm -hmm. this affect your faith? And if so, how? 
Yeah, I feel like I had a bit of a unique experience, like, officially coming out because I never really officially did it. Um, <laughs> I, I just it's kind right. of, yeah, I just, I started dating my partner. And once we realized, you know, we liked each other, we were on a coffee date and we just took all these cute photos. I was like, oh, like, I'll post these on Instagram. Not really realizing that, like, that it was pretty clear that it was a relationship. But I, I was just kind of oblivious. I was like, oh, like, it could be a friendship. Like, uh-huh. it, it was pretty clear. So it, for some people, that was really harmful because they felt like, oh, how can you tell me this? Um, mm. But I really just, to me, it just wasn't a huge deal. It's like, well, I've always, you know, I've been this way for so long. It just feels like I finally, like, showed people. It's not that I've really changed. It's like, hmm. you know, it, it. but to them, it was more of an abrupt change, which makes sense. Um, and I would, mm. if I could go back, I would do it differently, but I, I can't go back. So I, you know, that those were the consequences. Um, and so I think I had to work through relationships that maybe saw it as um, abrupt and mm. um, out of character and really mm. show that it feels like for the first time I am being authentic. Mm. And I think my character totally changed when I came out and Mm. when I was openly in this relationship um and I think you you don't really realize that until you know you were with me and I think my family saw it even my friends saw it and I just was just happy because I was Mm. no longer two conflicting identities I was one so Mm. then I really had to make the decision what do I want to do there were I think three churches in New Paltz and I knew I wanted to go back to church I hadn't really been to church in about a year um Mm. And, and so there was, you know, two churches that were relatively accepting. They had their pride flags outside. And then there was one church that I really loved. I really liked the pastor. I really loved the worship. The other two churches had, um, very like old hymns, which is what I grew up with. And for Mm. me, music is like so important in my Mm. worshiping. Mm -hmm. So I was like kind of torn between these churches. I decided I wanted to go to the one that wasn't openly accepting necessarily, because that was what I found theologically rich. And mm. I, I loved what they were teaching. They've never taught anything against homosexuality. And if they do, I would love to talk about that with them, you know? I love um, that about you, Heather. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just not afraid of having those conversations. So I started consistently going to a church this past year, um, the one that isn't openly accepting. And I think a lot of my friends thought that was weird when there are other <laughs> options. And I'm kind of like, well, it's not really weird to me because mm. our like the core of our faith is the same. And that's what matters. Like they, you know, they want to show the love of Jesus to the community. Perfect. I want to do that too. Mm. So that's I just, love that. I just want to be a mediator. And I brought my partner to this church. Like my pastor met them was definitely a little like confused, thought they were my (laughs) sibling, like (laughs) very confused. But, but like, you know, I still go every Sunday. We still talk. And I think, I think exposing more conservative Christians to, Hey, Mm. I'm a queer person. I don't actually have a agenda in your church. I'm just here for the same reasons you're here. Mm. I think that's really important. Um, And to just have those conversations with people. So that's really how I have been trying to build bridges. And I think that's just something that's been put on my heart. And I just see so much fruit from it Mm. that it doesn't even bother me if people say, you know, that's not biblical. You're leading people astray. It's like, I feel like I'm doing the exact opposite, you Mm. know, and and it's okay if like if you really think I'm leading people astray, you can think that. But like I know in my heart, like I feel I feel Jesus there and Mm. I haven't felt that way since I was young. So it it just Mm. feels rejuvenating. Yeah. Yeah. I think the biggest factor was understanding the intent behind what the other person was trying to tell me. Mm. So I had some really challenging conversations after I initially came out. (laughs) I had some really challenging conversations and at first I was really hurt by them, but I really had to think like this person loves me. Mm. That is true this person wants what's best for me. That is also true. This Mm. person is trying to understand the Bible and honor the Bible. Those three things are true and they're true for me too. So understanding those three things are true Mm. and that this person just had a different biblical conviction than I did. And I think that that is okay. And I think it's Mm. hard for people to accept that it's okay to have different biblical convictions, which just means honestly listening to people Mm. and not listening with an agenda or listening to change their mind. Um, And understanding their intent is just what's most important to me. 
I love that. That's exactly why I went to therapy because I wanted to understand, like I knew I wanted to salvage this relationship. And for me, that just meant I needed to love this person, but also understanding I needed to set boundaries so that mm -hmm. I'm not just hurting myself. Mm -hmm. Um, like if someone says something that's like a little off putting, um, I'll use sometimes boundary phrases, which is like, mm, I don't like that's an odd thing to say out loud or I love um, that. <laughs> it's my favorite one. Or just saying more neutral things that like, mm, I don't really want to talk about that with you right now. Yeah, I feel like for me, it was just such a personal choice of choosing mm. to be in the middle. I think that might not be the best choice for everyone. Mm. I kind of felt like I was already always in the middle, like being mm. a pastor's kid. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us more about that idea of um, like how, like you were saying, but I, I know I'm not doing that. Like, can you tell us like how you see what fruit you're seeing and how? You, yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I think it's so hard to describe unless you experience it. But mm. I think that initial feeling when you first become a Christian where you just kind of feel like, wow, like. And, and I think because I was young when I became a Christian, it wasn't an exact moment. It was just more of a span of time of sure. growing your faith. And when you really feel um, connected to God, and that was just, it was the strongest feeling I have ever experienced hmm. coming out and just re, really re, um, what's the word? Coming out and whole, like, grabbing Jesus again basically mm -hmm. and I felt like I was I was holding on to a thread for so long and it's like I you know made it to the top and now I'm you know holding on to Jesus himself and it's mm -hmm. just such a different experience than the conflicting identities and you know Christians hate me and then queer people hate me and you know mm. and just feeling so um flustered all the time whereas now I just feel like this is who I am mm. and Jesus loves me for who I am and I want to show that love to other people mm. um and just really having confidence in myself and in my faith and I think because of that I've really healed relationships in my life that have been really challenging in the past and mm. that I've struggled with. And I've learned, I, I went back to therapy specifically to heal some of these relationships. Mm. And so I think gaining that self-confidence of, I am not afraid to go to a place where I might not be wanted <laughs> mm. because, you know, we're there for the same reason. We both love Jesus. And I think seeing that fruit in my own now small church and going back to my childhood church um, and just having conversations with my Christian friends and also my queer friends and really being that middle person of, yeah. oh, you're actually like kind of a Christian and you're gay. Like, yeah, I am. Or mm. on the other side, wow, you're actually a Christian and you aren't racist or homophobic. Like, yeah, I am. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> Mm, being able mm -hmm. to be a person for that both people can relate to mm. um because we all aren't that different but we have such strict walls that separate us mm. so yeah what has been helpful in those conversations as mm. your this is not a question that i had sent you so yes. <laughs> whatever oh, no, whatever fine. you could add what is helpful in those conversations specifically with people who think it's a sin to be gay mm -hmm. and then is it for from your perspective is it more about you showing your life or is it like certain conversations you have like what helps you in those bridges and mm -hmm. are there any resources that have helped you as you're figuring yeah. this out yeah yeah so for me i think the biggest factor was understanding the intent behind what the other person was trying to tell me mm. so i had some really challenging conversations after i initially came out and um Hang on, my AirPods are falling out. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had some really challenging conversations, and at first I was really hurt by them, but I really had to think, like, this person loves me. Hmm. That is true. This person wants what's best for me. That is also true. This hmm. person is trying to understand the Bible and honor the Bible. Those three things are true, and they're true for me too. So understanding those three things are true Hmm. And that this person just had a different biblical conviction than I did. And I think that that is okay. And I think it's hmm. hard for people to accept that it's okay to have different biblical convictions. Hmm. And I'm in no way trying to tell someone else that what they believe is wrong hmm. because I'm not in their heart. I'm not God. Like, I don't know what their conviction is. 
Hmm. And so I think having that mutual respect of I am hearing what you have to say genuinely and I, I respect that. Like, I think you can come to the conclusion that homosexuality is a sin and that's your true conviction. Absolutely. Like, that's fine. I'm not going to question mm. that. Um, but I would just hope that, you know, that person would also understand I also have done that work and came to a different conclusion. Mm. So I think that mutual respect is just so important mm. in those conversations and in building bridges, just not being afraid of having those conversations in the first place. I think we can all be very afraid of conflict, very afraid mm -hmm. of bringing up those triggering subjects. Um, I remember in youth group, I like would ask in high school, I would ask my youth leader, like, well, actually, did you know that homosexuality was added to the Bible in 1946? Like I, you know, and I like brought in this Bible from the 1800s and she like was like, I'll talk to you next week. I need to think <laughs> about what I have to. So she had like, but I was just, I would always ask, you know, the, the tough questions because mm. I didn't realize that you weren't supposed to ask the tough questions. Mm. Um, yeah. And yeah. And so I think having and i'm not as confrontational anymore i used to be really you know on fire but now i'm much more like just as i want people to hear me mm. i want to make sure i'm giving that energy hmm. back so mm. any energy i expect i want to also reciprocate um which just means honestly listening to people mm. and not listening with an agenda or listening to change their mind um and understanding their intent is just what's most important to me i love that so that is a really a very difficult thing, especially when mm -hmm. you're the one who's hurt. And then I remember talking to her coffee. You're like, I was really hurt by this. So I went to therapy to learn how to build a bridge here. And I'm like, who does that? Like, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. What are some things for people who've been really hurt by the church? Like, what are some things that have helped you be able to find that healing and confidence you're talking about? And also, are there times when you have to set boundaries to protect yourself? And how do you know the difference? What does that look like for you? Yes, yes, definitely. That's exactly why I went to therapy, because I wanted to understand, like, I knew I wanted to salvage this relationship. And for me, that just meant I needed to love this person, but also understanding I needed to set boundaries so that mm -hmm. I'm not just hurting myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that comes with classic give and take. Like mm. some things I'm not going to comment on. Like if someone says something that's like a little off-putting, um, I'll use sometimes boundary phrases, which is like, mm, I don't like, that's an odd thing to say out loud. Or I love um, that. <laughs> it's my favorite one. Or just saying more neutral things that like, mm, I don't really want to talk about that with you right now. And I think things that they are combative. It's just setting a boundary yeah. of I'm not comfortable conversing about this right now but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you know i'm condemning you or hating mm -hmm. you it just means that it's you know not something i feel like talking about mm -hmm. and i think being okay with setting that boundary but still you can share like you can love that person you can still try and invest in that person's growth and they'll invest in your growth um what was the rest of the question? I love, it, like, that. I love that you brain. have, oh, that's okay. I love that you have boundary <laughs> phrases, like that mm -hmm. you can go to, you already know them mm -hmm. and can use them. That's awesome. Now, mm -hmm. are there any things that have helped you like find enough healing mm -hmm. or confidence to even be in the middle? Like you're saying, like what, mm -hmm. have there been specific things or just time or? Yeah, I feel like for me, it was just such a personal choice of choosing mm. to be in the middle. I think that might not be the best choice for everyone. Mm. I kind of felt like I was already always in the middle. Like being mm. a pastor's kid, you just kind of know things about your congregation that most, you know, 13-year-olds mm. don't know. Right, so right. I see both sides. I see all of the, you know, negative aspects of our church. And I could see, you know, my own dad, who's the pastor dealing with those negative aspects and then he's also a human and when your pastor mm. is a human and a father and you see his flaws as well as you know his many good things about him mm. um it it's it can just skew your perspective i think of the church and mm. and so i think i was always in the middle so it wasn't much of a change yeah. for me <laughs> um but yeah. i i just i think for people that maybe don't have much experience being in the middle. It's just really hard. And mm. I think I just, I just try not to be easily offended. I try to understand people's intent. Um, I generally think pretty well of people. I assume that people 
want to see me spiritually grow. So if Mm. someone says something that's a little off-putting, I try to understand their intent. Like, were they trying to maliciously harm me or were they just a little ignorant in what they were saying? Mm. Um, So I think that's just kind of the mindset I have to go into situations with. And I've just found it so fruitful and it just feels so freeing to me, you know, Mm. to be in those, that middle situation. That's awesome. And I love how you said like, not, this isn't necessarily for everybody. Like this is almost like you feel like a calling for you, Mm -hmm. it seems like. like And that's okay. There isn't any like shame in that. I I never want to be the type of person that's like, you have to, you know, do X, Y, and Z because you don't. Everyone's on their own journey. And I think that that's also really important to acknowledge. Yeah. And to know yourself and what you Mm -hmm. can do and what you're called to in Mm -hmm. a sense. And I think this is just an incredible, like, I guess, calling really like that you felt Mm -hmm. on your life. And yeah. So are there, as we talk about this bridges, are there places where it's helpful to talk more like about the the theology you're coming from and why biblically you come to different conclusions? Like, is it helpful to have any conversations like that? Or has it just been more of like more helpful to just kind of be who you are as a witness, just as your person? And when it comes to theology, are there resources that have been helpful for you to understand what you believe and like almost reconcile this biblically compared to how you were brought up believing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, something, okay, something about resources is most years I would be gifted some sort of Christian book for Christmas. And looking through all of them, I'm kind of like, most of these just have things in them that I I don't agree with. A lot of amazing material, but then there's always that one section about like homosexuality or something just a little Uh off-putting. And I'm kind of like, it was so good until (laughs) now. (laughs) And again, again, I will read it. I absolutely will read it. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and try to understand where they're coming from. And I understand, I do. Um, and, and so I think resources I really struggled with because mm. I felt like I couldn't find any that were, um, that were really like helpful to me right now where I am yeah. in life. And yeah. I know you've sent me some and I have yet to get them just because I'm tight on money right now, but I'm and planning on college. <laughs> I mean, you have yes. a lot going on. <laughs> college. Yeah. I honestly feel like most of my like resources have just come from people and mm. come from like my mom and really having those conversations. I'm a verbal processor. Mm. So like conversations with you and conversations with people in my church. And I think talking about theology is still really important. And mm. I think once I was able to focus on, I understand the gospel, it is 100% the core of my faith. How mm. do I build off of that? Mm. And something that I really love about my current church is my pastor is much more, um, if we're reading a difficult passage, here's what, you know, people believe and here's what I believe, but this isn't the only answer. And I think that's mm. a really important way to go about looking at challenging passages and more yeah. in-depth theology and I think growing up with such black and white answers, right. it's been such a shift trying to change. Um, actually, other people can believe other things and that's okay, you know? Mm. So I feel like I almost just have to sit in not knowing. And it's like I have things that I know are true. Mm. And then I just have to sit in the unknown of, mm. is this really important to know 100%? Hmm. Or is it okay to just think, I might never know, but that Mm. isn't really going to affect how I live out my faith. Mm. Um, So, and not in an invalidating way. It's like, in a way, I feel like I'm trying to honor the Bible more by doing that. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think at the beginning, you had said it felt like you were reading out of two different books, like when you came to the Bible, Um, which you, and I think I just love how you've talked about the intent and just realizing Mm -hmm. like, it does feel like we're reading out of two different books and we're not, but that intent is the same on both sides, like wanting yes. to honor the Bible, wanting to love God. Absolutely. And I just, oh, that's what I want us to get as Christians. Like, mm-hmm. it's so easy to blame the other side of their whatever. They're, you know, mm-hmm. they, they're just haters or they just don't care yes. about the Bible. But in fact, mm-hmm. yeah. Is there anything else you would want yes. to say about that? Yes, I think, um, like what you were just saying, a lot of more, maybe more conservative Christians think like, oh, like they're just haters, they have an agenda, and then we're looking at them thinking they're haters, they're trying to, you know, shut us out, and I'm like, yeah, 
if we focus more on the similarities, like that's how we're going to grow. We aren't going to get anywhere by pointing at each other Mm -hmm. and, you know, yelling that the other person's wrong because we could both be wrong. Like I'll never know until I die. And I say this all the time, (laughs) you know, like I'll be talking with um, my partner and I'm like, yeah, I'll never know how the earth was created till the day I die. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, I'm like, and that's okay. I'm okay. I'm okay knowing that. Like, yeah. And so, um, anyway, but it's just like those types of issues where um, you just you just kind of sometimes just it's okay to not know. Yeah. And yeah. And just have those like tough conversations and understanding the intent of those people. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. I remember as a kid raised also in a different church, but very like mm-hmm. very literal interpretation. So it's like mm-hmm. seven day creation, all this. And then yes. my dad one day goes, I mean, God could have created the earth in seven million years. If evolution is true, doesn't mean God didn't started and created exactly. and i was like and that's <gasps> father what are you saying you know but just that yeah. like no and i think the same i'm like god absolutely could have created the earth in seven days but also he could have created it in longer right. he could have created it so that it evolved i'm like i'll never know i wasn't there <laughs> yeah yeah so. and there's all different ways you could yeah study and interpret and understand that passage and come mm-hmm. to different conclusions yeah that's a side yeah, trail I but i think, think it's a good example Yes, yeah. it's, it is a good example. Um, and I'm glad you clarified because I shouldn't have just like dropped that and ran. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also think um, something I've noticed is a lot of more conservative, like traditional Christians get really surprised when I am so open to their ideas because yes. I think they have a bias of I'm not going to listen and I have an agenda of what I want to believe and I'm picking and choosing from the mm. Bible. Whereas in reality, like, this is just what I've come to the conclusion of. And I'd love to hear what you're t- studying and what you're on your journey with. Mm. So it's like, I think bringing that love that yeah. they don't expect is really crucial to this mm. whole situation. Um, and I think part of my coming out journey is I almost wanted to like have that unconditional love of Jesus so that people couldn't point at me and say, look, mm. she's gay and now she's like off the rails. It's like I wanted to keep that like love mm. that I think Jesus would want me to have, um, even if it means kind of maybe putting up a little bit more than I should have. Mm. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think like, how do how will they know we're Christians? Jesus says, mm-hmm. doesn't say by our theology, doesn't say by, you know, what we've decided. It's by our love for each other. Yes. And we forget mm-hmm. that a lot of times in Christian circles. And I think even like we call evangelicals evangelicals and they're so proselytizing and all this, there's this idea <laughs> of it. Not that that's, and that's not true for everybody, but it is for some. And then on the other side, I see people who deconstruct and become just as evangelical, but on the opposite side of issues. It's like exactly. we've forgotten yes. the whole point of the gospel. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's not fighting, it's loving each other. Exactly. And, yeah. So speaking of love, I know in our coffee day, as we start to slowly wrap up here, um, yes. what you have, you had said that the LGBTQ plus the queer community had taught you, mm-hmm. had shown you a picture of what church could be, of what Christian community yes. could be. Could you talk about that? Yes. I think a lot of Christians would like be unhappy with me saying this, but I will always say this. I think that the LGBTQ plus community has got love down. Like Mm. everyone is celebrated there. And it's like, if Mm. you come out, you're entering a space where you're celebrated just by existing. Mm. And if you see another queer person eating dinner or on a date or something, it's like you have that bond of like, hey, Mm. like me, you know, and it's just it's such a a welcoming and lovely group of people Mm. that have just been hated for so long. And I think that is what Christian should look like. Like that is mm. what the body of Christ should look like. We should be celebrated. And mm. I think like even I was when I was typing up notes for this, I was like, well, I mean, I guess we're celebrated with like baptism, but like my baptism, I like read my testimony and was like dunked under and uh-huh. then everyone would like be like congratulations, but I'm like it so I'm like I could see maybe some churches are more celebratory than others. Mm. But for me, I was a little stressed. Like yeah. it wasn't this big like wow, like you know, and it, and I just, I feel like if I walk into a room of Christians, I just kind of feel like I'm judged or I'm being watched or whoever mm. is the best. It's And so it's just a much different energy rather than just celebrating the fact that we're all a part of the body of Christ. Mm. And so I think that Christians could learn so much from the queer community mm. by just seeing how they treat people. Mm. And you see how quickly that community fostered and 
I think the church can do the exact same thing. Hmm. So now I think one of the things with that idea of love, I wonder if there's, have you seen different understandings of what it means to love? Mm -hmm. I think I hear a lot of conservative Christians talk about you love somebody by pointing out their sin in a sense. Mm -hmm. And like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Are there times when Mm -hmm. maybe someone's in the queer community, but in a harmful relationship and you have to like, you know, like how, what is that balance or is, yeah. Does that make sense? That question? Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I think that's something I still like actively struggle with Mm. understanding that line of love, because I do think there are plenty of times like I know queer people that are in unhealthy relationships and Mm. it's really challenging to understand when it's time to point that out because Mm. I think often people will then be labeled as like, oh, you're homophobic. Um, mm. I guess they can't play that card on me anymore. Yeah. But that was always my fear. <laughs> right. Um, but I think that is like a valid concern for straight people that want to point out um, like unhealthy relationships. And that's really hard. And that's something that I'm like actively trying to understand and going through right now. Mm. Um, but I think for me, love has like I go back to love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy or boast. And my um, my dad did a sermon series on that, I think when I was in high school. And it was incredible really to just think about all of the things that love is. Mm. And so when, when I look at that, it's like, uh, and there's other passages, the, you know, like the, oh, now I'm forgetting the statistic, but it's like the amount of sins you should find in yourself before the other person. And mm. so it's, you know, I, I I don't know if it's like 700 to seven or something or 7,000, but it's a big number. Huh. And yeah, I so hadn't I heard think that before. there's, yeah. oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to find it. Um, But I think that really we should be focusing on ourselves. And unless there's like a direct harm, um, mm. I think loving for me is just being there for the person. Mm. And if I'm not... um. Like, I think investing in someone's growth. So if someone mm. is in a harmful place, I think it's important to be honest. But I think we aren't we aren't the police that's calling out everyone's sins mm. and then not fostering any sort of relationship with them. Yeah. So I think yeah. that is where Christians tend to go wrong. Like, mm. when my older sibling came out and people were coming up to me saying the weirdest things, and I would just be kind of like, okay, you haven't even talked to this person mm. before. Like, do you have mm-hmm. a relationship with them? Do you, do you have you any know, then I would really respect. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So I think, um, I think love has to look different for every relationship, I guess mm. is my answer. Yeah. I remember reading this book years ago called Ferrisectomy, Getting Rid of Our Inner mm-hmm. Pharisee. And it talked about oh, how- Oh, that sounds so good. Yeah. It talked about like this <laughs> idea of a bank account. Like, and a relationship with someone is like a bank account and you need to make sure you put in way more withdrawals and plenty mm-hmm. of them before you make a, or way more deposits before you make a withdrawal. Mm-hmm. So like, have you invested in this person's life? If not, yes. then you don't have the right to, to make that withdrawal of like calling 100%. them out on something. Yeah. And I think we forget that. And I think too, like I, I had a friend, um, when I was in my twenties, he was one of my best friends. And I remember one time we were talking. I was like, do you see anything in my life that like I should be convicted of and like I need to work on? And he's like, oh yeah. And I was like, what is it? He's like, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not God. He'll tell you what he's ready to tell you. And I was, what a different approach, you know, like we're so quick to Mm -hmm. be like, but maybe it's not time on your journey when you're ready to hear that. Maybe it's not, you know, like you said, if there's not direct harm, like maybe you're not the person to say this right now. So I think like being slow to speak and really thinking about it. I I definitely agree with that. And I love that you brought up the fact that someone might not be ready in their journey to hear that. Yeah. Um, Because I think in high school, like I was really struggling with bitterness and with Mm. um, just like resentment. And I think if someone had like prodded at me about that, they wouldn't realize it was because of Mm. X, Y, and Z. So I think it would have made me spiral even more. So Mm. I think understanding those things, there can be a lot of layers to people's behavior. So I think fostering mm. those relationships. I, I love that. Yeah. That's a really good, that's a really good point. We don't know the layers. Mm-hmm. We don't know what's going on. Yeah. So I have just two more questions, three more questions <laughs> for you. Um, <laughs> something many of us have been taught is that a person can't have a real faith and be openly in the mm-hmm. queer community, but you are yet another yes. living proof that you can be. So that's a phrase I've had in my head since our last coffee date, vibrant faith. Mm-hmm. Like your faith is just mm-hmm. very alive and vibrant. Um, can you tell us what faith means to you now and how it's changed these last few years? Um, I know you've talked yeah. about this a little bit, but if you mm-hmm. want to share anything else. 
yeah, I just feel like, like I said, my faith is just as vibrant as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And I think I just feel in my heart that it's different. And I think a lot of people might think differently or, you know, that I'm being deceived or something. But like, I just, I know in my heart that it's true. And that's really, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all that matters to me. Mm -hmm. I think faith is between me and God and mm -hmm. no one else. And so I think that that's also important to like understand moving forward. And I think making that distinction of faith being that such a personal relationship. <laughs> Natalie um, is, is here today, baby. I love you. Sign, Natalie. Oh. Hi, beautiful. <laughs> huh. Um, yeah. So I think, hi, Natalie. I think that that has just been um really important for my faith journey. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So as we wrap up this interview, I have two final questions. First, let's go to a bird's eye view again. Part of deconstruction is asking what parts of my faith do I bring forward with me, and what parts do I leave behind. So I'm asking all my guests, do you have any examples of this in your own life that you'd feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, I think for me, having confidence in who I am as a person, mm -hmm. because I, and having confidence that God will convict me if he wants to convict me about anything. Mm -hmm. And just really having confidence in myself and in my faith and bringing that into my Christian community, into my queer community, into my family, into everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um and just really being an active listener, being open to other people's ideas and not being afraid of any part of my identity um, mm. because I'm here for Jesus. And mm. that's just what I always go back to. Yeah. And that's like something you've taken with you, like since you were a child, like that yes. idea of like, yes, I want to love God and love others. Mm -hmm. Like it sounds like that's exactly. kind of, yeah. It's definitely what I've taken. Mm -hmm. I love that. So lastly, do you have any resources or even just advice for people who are deconstructing their faith and questioning their sexuality. What would you say to somebody in that, that situation? I think for me, having people I could talk to was like my resource. Mm -hmm. And I think really clinging to Christians that were similar, like I think your videos and all the things you talk about on this mm -hmm. podcast and on your channel are just so important. And I think like, I hope there's young, you know, queer Christians watching this that mm -hmm. had that little ray of hope that like I needed in my bedroom when I was young. And mm -hmm. I think it's like almost a full circle moment for me. Like I grew mm. up watching um, your content and I think like just clinging to it, it was like all I had. <laughs> and, and so I think really holding on to that and holding on to just the goodness of God and mm. the, the unconditional love of Jesus, just holding on to that because mm. sometimes your circumstances, the people around you are great. And mm. that isn't God and making that separation. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's it just, it just gets better. Mm -hmm. That's so better good to time. know that it gets better. Mm -hmm. I think that's yes. important. Yeah. And like, I never in a million years thought I would be sitting here today. Like, and I just, yeah. I, and it just feels so genuine, you mm -hmm. know? I love that. And one more thing for any listeners, um, mm -hmm. if you're looking for a resource about the theology why we why we would think the Bible is meant to be understood differently. Matthew Vines of the Reformation Project has a ton of resources, books, videos, an online course you can go through um, all about, he, he makes the case for his book is called um, The Biblical Case for Same-Sex Relationships. And he has tons of resources on that product, pro, um, that idea that have been really helpful for me. So if you're looking for something like that, check it out at the Reformation Project. So Heather, thank you so much for being here today. I loved getting to talk with you and thank you for your courage and your vulnerability and sharing your story. And I'll see all of you next week for another episode about growing the good Christian girl. <laughs>